Hello and welcome back to Laughing Through the Pain, Navigating Wellness with me, Richard L. Blake, my co-host, Andrew Esam, and today we've got Tony Wrighton, best-selling author in 13 languages, focusing on health, biohacking and mindset. He is also the host of the Zestology podcast and an expert on histamine intolerance and a former Sky Sports News presenter. So welcome, Tony. Richard, Andrew, thank you for having me on. Andy, how are you doing today? Very good, thanks, mate. Yeah, I just finished a four-day course in Vedic meditation. Oh, nice. So I'm feeling particularly zen. Yeah, very good, actually, yeah. I'm like, it was very um, simple to follow and, uh, yeah, something you can easily wedge into your everyday life. So, yeah, feeling good. And, And what is Vedic meditation exactly? I'm still not totally sure, but the basic principle is that you follow a specific mantra to essentially guide the mind into a deeper sense of consciousness. And the brilliant thing about it is it's not particularly, there's no right or wrong. It's not like you have to keep trying to follow certain things. Thoughts can come, but it's all good. 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon. Yeah, enjoyed it. Uh, Are you feeling the benefits? How's your life changed? It's too early to say, but I think the energy, not having so many energy spikes and just a more sustained level of concentration, I suppose. Nice. Yeah, that sounds. Well, you can sound tell happy. me. Yeah, we'll see. This is the yeah, ultimate we'll test. See. <laughs> yeah. Tony, Tony, and I have known each other for a few years. Been around in the biohacking industry for a while. I met Tony because I was walking down the street and I shouted at him, "Love the to- podcast, Tony!" And uh, he turned around <laughs> and went, "Oh, cheers!" And then I emailed him a few days later saying, "Hi, I was the guy who shouted at you at the streets. Yeah. Do you want to try some breath work?" And he was like, "Sure." And then we did a podcast episode, and and, and he did some breath work, and yeah, didn't mind me shouting at him in the streets. Oh, yeah, it was a beautiful friendship which started mm. right there after the health optimization summit yeah the which first was one. i think it was pretty much the first one yeah yeah that's right yeah yeah the health optimization summit is a biohacking summit it's a good one i think it's one of the best so it's about biohacking so tony what is biohacking to you <laughs> i guess biohacking is the conventional definition of biohacking is optimizing mind and body and it very much plays into my type a personality of being utterly obsessed with solving problems Um, which isn't actually always the best thing to do. For example, with health, 12 hours of Googling normally doesn't produce a particularly good outcome, but actually switching off and doing less often does. And that can play into biohacking as well. So it's, it's using tech, supplements, gadgets, techniques, anything to feel better in your mind and your body. And where there aren't natural ways to do that, using technology to help you yeah nice Andy. how did you get in it, into it i i got really ill i went to the philippines on holiday around 10 years ago and i got this mystery virus went to see the doctor out there and he said yeah you've got measles and i was thinking i'm pretty sure i have measles as a child i don't think it's measles and then came back and the doctors told me that there are some viruses that just haven't been mapped in various parts of the world. And I'd had one of them. They could tell I'd had a virus from my red blood count and, and various things like that. But what followed was a post-viral reaction quite similar to long COVID. And uh, I was just out of action for ages. And I d- couldn't go to work. At that time, I was working at Sky. I am now forever the person introduced on podcasts as, and he used to be a Sky Sports <laughs> presenter. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I spent years waiting for you to announce Harry Kane to Man United. So, <laughs> oh, I feel, yeah, yes, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have disappointed. In the end, I watched far too many reruns of Lincoln versus Gillingham and less reporting on Harry Kane moving to Man United or anyone else. Uh, but, but yeah, so at that point I was working at Sky, but I wasn't able to go into the office. So that's what led me down the, the route of biohacking. Discovered Dave Asprey and his podcast and some of the other luminaries in the field. And then I just thought, I'm going to do my own podcast on it. Like you guys. Now we've all got a podcast. Yeah, everyone's got one. <laughs> Andy's going to get one as well. It's just so we can have one each. <laughs> I think that'd be a great idea. But you've got to be on his as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> of, course. of course. I'll be the noob oh, in to. that one. I'll ask all the stupid questions. Not that your questions are stupid, but the question, the basic questions. <laughs> Poor choice of words there. Your tra- questions are great, Andy. Andy, what's your next question? I actually, <laughs> I was doing a bit of homework and I came across a phrase, histamine intolerance. 
Mm. And other than antihistamines, which I take for hay fever, I don't really understand what that means. So could you give us a bit of... Sure. So Mm. my background has always been, I've been an author for 20 years, a presenter, and I trained in the skills of neuro-linguistic programming, which is, it's a study of how we do things well, really, and how we do things well and how other people do things well. And it served me very well. And it ties in excellently with biohacking which I loved when I discovered biohacking but I'd always had these unexplained health problems going on in the background and I could never quite figure it out uh, and I could sort of never um, quite figure out why I had these gut issues I tried every diet gave up gluten dairy soy went vegan that didn't work Mm -hmm. (laughs) tried lots of different diets (laughs) but there's this concept in NLP, which says the more choices that you give yourself, the more options that you give yourself, it's called the law of requisite variety, the more that you're likely to stumble upon something that works very well. So right at the bottom of my list, I never gave up histamine intolerance. And that's because it was the most confusing. And so I tried everything else. Gluten didn't work. (laughs) Vegan definitely didn't work. Soy was disgusting. I thought, right, I've only got histamine left. And within about three hours of going on the low histamine diet, I started to feel not just a little bit better, but loads better. So then I naturally had to write a book about it. <laughs> yes, I think I proofread that that book for you. Was that the oh, one I thank I you. read? Yeah, yeah, I can't remember. I probably I probably peddled a few to you over the years. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So yeah, can you tell us more about what what exactly is histamine? What is histamine intolerance? What are histamine, high histamine foods, that kind of thing? Yeah. So histamine is, we've all got histamine in our bodies. In fact, in every cell of our bodies, we need histamine to survive. It helps with the immune response. But some of us just produce too much histamine. We've got too much histamine in our bodies. It's a bit like the analogy that I like is a little bit like nightclub bouncers. You want a few bouncers to look after you if things get out of hand but too many it's just (laughs) gonna get it's not not gonna be good and yeah when you're making too much histamine all sorts of different symptoms can come up and the list is so long that it's almost every symptom that you've ever heard of but they include the classic allergy symptoms like stuffy nose runny eyes definitely gut issues definitely skin issues but then all sorts of inflammation people really suffer a lot more with the menopause when there's histamine stuff going on as well there is a huge list of different problems just for example when i used to eat prawns my heart rate used to go really high really quickly and i could never figure it out but it was histamine so that's just an example of some of the symptoms that people can suffer with and that that i was going with and then the reason that it's such a hard diet to figure out is that with gluten once you've got a, a working understanding of what gluten is and what the gluten-free diet is, you could pretty much go into a shop and figure out what you should buy and what you shouldn't. If you can read a label, you'll be all right. <laughs> but with, with histamine intolerance, I've been at this years and years now, and I still have to consult the lists hmm. and remember what's going on. And then sometimes I get it wrong anyway, and then I have a little histamine reaction. The list of foods that are high histamine is seemingly random. Yeah, you've got a great list, actually. When I've done the histamine diet, your website has a, that you use a, a color coding system of a red, yellow and green. Yeah. You, what, what's your website for anyone who wants to check that out? Tony? Thank you. Yeah, that one's yeah. histamineintolerance.net. And okay. uh, it's a combination of some of the, the world's best lists and then my own research as well. Mm. But but everyone is different. So sometimes people write to me and they say, you said that rice is absolutely fine, but I feel dreadful. And I, mm. I make the point throughout that I'm, I'm not the, the sole arbiter of what is low histamine. And then, of course, I might have said that, low, that rice is low histamine. But the rice that they are referring to, they might have cooked three days ago, left in the fridge, and it might have gone moldy. And then I mm. can't be responsible for your high histamine moldy rice. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That's one of the, the trickiest things about the low histamine diet is you can't have leftovers, right? Leftovers is problematic. Yeah, especially meat, actually. Mm. And they've just found that the more that you leave cooked food, the more it increases in histamine content. And there's two different ways that this might cause a problem. Firstly, the histamine content in food, and then what's known as histamine liberators. So foods that are low in histamine, but you eat them and they liberate the histamine inside you. So I'm very good at freezing leftovers now. And if Mm. you do that, then it's absolutely fine. So my wife is always takes the mickey out of me for how I'm utterly obsessed. Whenever we cook something nice, I'll say to her, 
why don't we make this again, but in a massive batch and then freeze it <laughs> in small little packs? <laughs> Yeah, that is a great strategy for food prep. Yeah, because most health fitness people, certainly Sunday is their food prep day and they'll make exactly. their meals for the whole week. And yeah. then if you can't have leftovers, that becomes really challenging. But of course you can. If yeah, you do, you, do you do that, Rich? Not so much. I used to, but yeah, no, thankfully we have Natalia cooks most of our stuff fresh. Oh. And, and, uh, so yeah, pretty lucky in that regard. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But daily portions are good but i think freezing is good anyway it just freezes in the goodness it does yeah so why did you go on the low histamine diet then rich just as an experiment i've got gut issues i've had gut issues i also have a lot of itchiness issues really itchy scalp itchy skin especially after i shower so i thought it could be histamine I, and in the end what i've What's helped me was low dose naltrexone. So I now work with a company called Live Health and low dose naltrexone is something they give to people with autoimmune conditions. So naltrexone is what they give to things like for people who have heroin overdoses. But then they found it was some kind of funny story where they found it in mothers who were heroin addicts when they gave naltrexone to them their kids had like low dose naltrexone in their bodies and they had much lower incidences of autoimmune conditions. I may be butchering that story, but it, it's something <laughs> to do with mothers, heroin addicts, and then them discovering that this micro dose of naltrexone is great for almost all autoimmune conditions. And it has really helped with my itchiness and my, my stool wow. stuff. So was it histamine that could was be. then relieved by that? <laughs> could be. Yeah. It could be. Mm. So how long has the knowledge of histamine been around then? Because it sounds like it's all pretty new, this, because what you, you said yourself, they don't tend to declare histamine on packages in supermarkets. Mm. Why is that? It, it is new. And I've definitely been suffering with histamine intolerance longer than the phrase has been in existence. But the, the, uh, the history of histamine itself is actually quite interesting because we didn't really know about histamine in the world until the early 90, until the early 20th century. And then around the 1930s, various scientists started, invented the first antihistamines, which didn't work particularly well and actually made people worse and spiked their symptoms and gave them a load of side effects as well, which wasn't really what you wanted. And then some, a different form of anti, the first proper antihistamines were developed. And I think it was during the Second World War, a massive experiment was conducted, which was seriously unethical because it was on a load of sailors sailing from the US to Europe. And they didn't tell the sailors that they were part of the experiment, which, which should set alarm bells ringing. But the experiment was that they wanted to see if antihistamines would help with seasickness. And it did massively. So half the ship, were the control half of the experiment and were rolling around being sick. The conditions were dreadful in the middle of the winter in the Atlantic as these soldiers were going to, to Europe. And the other half, who'd taken this fairly experimental sort of 1.1 uh, generation antihistamine, were absolutely fine. So, yeah, not a particularly ethical experiment, but they realized then that they had something on their hands. And now, as you say, people take it for allergies all the time and they can help with histamine intolerance as well. Nice. And there's this idea of the, the histamine bucket, isn't it? It's not just you can sometimes you can have, let's say, chocolate, which is a histamine liberator and mm. be fine. And then sometimes it can create a load of symptoms. So, yeah. What, what's that bucket analogy? The histamine bucket was first coined by another practitioner called uh, Dr. Janice Janasia, who is one of the foremost histamine authors around. And she noticed and then coined this brilliant phrase, the histamine bucket, which is essentially... Sometimes you can put all the wrong things into your body and you'll be absolutely fine. So pretty much the highest histamine thing in the world. Sorry to disappoint anyone who's a red wine drinker, but it is red wine. And sometimes if your histamine bucket is low, you can have loads of red wine, some chocolate, some avocados, the other high histamine things, and you'll be OK. The other times, if your histamine bucket is full to the brim and you put one little bit of chocolate in or a sip of red wine and it will start to spill over and you'll get this cascade of symptoms as your histamine bucket is too high and that's just one of the reasons why it's just i think it's so hard for people living with histamine intolerance because they say well, i was eating white chocolate last tuesday and i'm absolutely fine why am i not fine now but i think it's also one of the reasons why my 
books and this site that you mentioned have actually ended up doing really well because it's a side project for me. It's not my main work. And yet the amount of people who contact me every day about histamine intolerance, it's incredible. And I think there's a lack of good quality information and then it's so bloody confusing <laughs> that they need someone to hold their hand and help them. Yeah, so is this something that like just naturally passes through your system or is it something you can detox or is it, how does it work the, it does in terms pass of the, the bucket level? System quite quickly and that is one of the really good things about trying a low histamine diet because it's quite hard to do a test for histamine intolerance because our levels depend on all sorts of things for instance often people's histamine levels will generally be highest early in the morning very early in the morning three four five o'clock in the morning and they'll be much lower in the mid-afternoon so it depends what time of day you test it depends what food you ate the night before it depends whether you're stressed or not it depends what time of the month it is if you're a woman there are so many different factors but you can see quite quickly by going on a three day or one week or two week low histamine diet which we've got all the details on the site if people want to try it you can then start to see if you start to feel better and because the histamine bucket can empty quite quickly, you can dramatically feel better, just like I did. Mm. Yeah, I think that's uh, for people who are interested, who people may be thinking, oh, this rings a lot of bells. This is a lot like my symptoms or whenever I eat strawberries, I feel itchy or I yeah. get IBS or things like that. That is the way to do it. Go to Tony's website, read some <laughs> of the stuff bookmark his list of foods and yeah. uh, create a shopping list of all the green foods and then just do yeah three days of no histamine or very low histamine foods and and, and, and track it see how you feel yeah i've just brought out a new edition of the book histamine intolerance explained and i put some um, pictures in it of uh, me in the past me at 18 uh, have eating basically i lived in italy for a few months and i was very much on the pizza and prosecco diet there <laughs> and i go through the various foods pizza high histamine prosecco high histamine um polished off with a dollop of chocolate ice cream high histamine and then there's a picture of me at 21 at university on the beer and kebab diet and honestly, you wouldn't believe how inflamed and odd I look in this picture. <laughs> it, 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 for so long, I was drinking beer and just ignoring the fact that I would feel so much worse than all my mates at the same time. And now it makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was the same. You, know, you used to get lash rash, just go red, <laughs> and my hands would swell up and things. And yeah, I, I just detox very slowly from alcohol, which is which makes me quite a fun drunk. And it also makes me quite fun when I'm hungover because I'm still a little <laughs> bit drunk. It, it also means that I'm wrecked for several days after. I think that's actually a really interesting point. So you think that you detox slowly from alcohol, which gives you a big hangover. Mm. And presumably, you then find that if you it's not just that, but food as well. If you eat four donuts in a day, you might feel worse than somebody else who can just who, whose system can bounce back a lot quicker. Yeah, exactly. And that's what's quite frustrating is like some people will just be like, oh, just get the beers down. Yeah, I'm fine. I can drink 10 yeah. beers and then go to work the next day and eat a kebab diet. And that's great for them. I've got the statistics with my aura ring. Like I look like mm. uh, after a, a night of a couple of drinks, it looks like I'm like seriously ill. Like I have mm. a, a raging cold or things like that. So my heart rate goes up about 20 beats. My HRV goes down ridiculously low. My sleep is terrible. My temperature is raised. I'm breathing mm. more. So yeah, it, it is frustrating to be someone who just can't, can't you know, handle their booze is what the lads would say. But yeah, that, that is effectively what it is. <laughs> yeah, certainly back in the day, let's face it, at university and beyond, there were sort of certain substances that we all tried. And some people would seem to <laughs> you know, looks of utter incomprehension <laughs> from the panel. Um, <laughs> and some people would just seem to brush it off. And I would have like two week come down. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. shocking. So the same thing. And I'm now finally in a very comfortable place where I'm really happy being the most boring one. And actually, we got invited out with a couple of other couples here in Portugal for a sort of a boozy night in a few weeks. And I really don't want to go. And I've told my wife, I'll tell them I don't want to go as well because I don't want to get drunk with them. I like them very much, <laughs> but I'd rather just meet them in the morning for a coffee instead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> I want to touch on the sort of the psychosomatic stuff of histamine because oh, yeah. I think with chronic illnesses, it can become really in your mind. You can become almost a hypochondriac as a biohacker. I'm sure there are many biohacking hypochondriacs out there. Yeah. But at the same time, 
there are real psychosomatic symptoms. For example, like I would be, I used to get my itchiness after I'd shower and go to bed. I would notice that if something stressful happened, if I got a phone call with some like bad news, I would get really itchy <laughs> just from bad wow. news. Like my diet yeah. would be, be the same and then something stressful would happen and my body liberates this list all this cortisol and then i guess the cortisol spikes mm. the, the histamine as well but uh, yeah what are your what's your take on that oh yeah and to be honest this is probably the point in the podcast where your listeners will be quite a few will be listening and saying oh my goodness maybe that's me as well and it is definitely possible it shocked me doing the research for this second edition of my book which it's taken about a year to do and I worked with the editor of one of the UK's top health magazines to, who, who fact-checked the whole thing. And then we went through all the references and all the studies together. And I know you're big on studies, Rich. And I was amazed at how much research there is around the links between stress and histamine. And it's very much a two-way street in that when we're suffering from histamine issues, we get more stressed. And when we're suffering from stress, our histamine levels increase so one leads to the other leads to the other and that can obviously be a, a vicious cycle yeah sorry my camera went off for a second there i don't know if, uh, if oh, i went no blank etc no but um, yeah yeah I, uh, I styled it out not much not like a sky sports pro at all exactly, where's it gone yeah. oh no i'm gonna have to try and keep talking and i'm terrible at that <laughs> yeah that's where you are in the big bucks tony uh, yeah <laughs> do you know annie hopper have you heard of her stuff related to this no so she does works with people who do sorry who have chronic illnesses whether it's histamine or mast cell or all, all sorts of things mm. and she is all about reprogramming your reactions to to stress because you know some people will they'll be develop sensitivities to absolutely everything like perfume some people can't go into mm. perfume stores because they get symptom reactions and what she does is yeah tr tries to get people over that psychosomatic stuff but for people who maybe think yeah, my stuff is partly psychosomatic. I'd recommend Annie Hopper's course. Mm. And that's why it's been quite nice doing my main job has been as an author on mindset for the last 20 years, that along, alongside the TV work. And that's where they come together because working on, I've had nearly every client that I work with has a sort of oversensitized, hyper aware, <laughs> stressed, natural state and they just need to and often they're worrying about their symptoms whether it's histamine intolerance or, or something else multiple times per minute in some instances and that is where some of these nlp techniques come in really nicely just like a, a simple pattern interrupt of probably quite similar to what annie hopper does but maybe yeah. a little bit differently physically possibly even out loud telling yourself stop when you think about those symptoms yet again for the sort of 15th time in the last hour and then giving yourself a suggestion for what to think about instead. Something like, I, I like to use something like, I choose to trust in my health and flow from moment to moment, just to remind myself to get into the moment. When I started doing that, I was using that multiple times a minute. And some of my clients will use that as well because they are so stressed and they're obsessed with their symptoms. And it can be very liberating for them. A couple of days of doing that, and well, we call it a pattern interrupt in NLP, it's so boring having to tell yourself stop multiple times a minute that in the end, they, their, brain, their unconscious mind just gives up and goes and worries about something else instead. What is a, do you say NLP? So NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming, used a lot in health, therapy, sports psychology, used by millions of people all over the world. It's sort of been around 50, 60 years or so. And yeah, that's what I trained in. It's got, a, got quite a mixed reputation. I guess it's partly mixed because Neil Strauss wrote about it in his book, The oh, Game. No, um, no one's and that no, is I haven't because, read that. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can be used very much in, in persuasion. You can make your language a lot more persuasive. So I, being an author, wanted to write a book on it. And I wrote a book about how to use your NLP powers for positive change. And, and I, it, listen, it's a really great set of tools and still there's a lot of interest in it in, in NLP. And it's been really good to see how many people are interested in, in using these tools. And I presumably that would be prescribed for people who are, are not just stressed, but you get a lot of overthinkers and a lot of people who ruminate, myself yes. being one, to be honest. 
Yeah. <laughs> Overthinking is not a skill. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> And I've actually got a chapter in my book on overthinking. And there's lots of, sort of different ways you can use that. But really, I think the pattern interrupt is such a good one. When, people, when I talk about a pattern interrupt, sometimes it's hard to explain. So I'll just say, when you're doing something very absorbing, which requires all your focus, and you're absolutely in the moment, and then you get a text message, and it's from someone you know, and you think, oh, I better check it, and the flow has gone. That is a pattern interrupt. Pattern interrupts can seriously annoy us but they could also be used to our advantage which is why when we're ruminating or really stressed about something or obsessed about something we use a pattern interrupt to get out of it and start to feel uh, better and think about something else instead yeah i think maladaptive emotion regulation strategies i talk a lot about those for as a cause of anxiety and, and ruminating is one of the leading causes of anxiety and yeah for people who some I know some people are like oh I, overthinking is great oh it it is a skill Tony you're wrong mm. so what what would you, do you have to say to those people who are like, no I'm not giving up my overthinking because it helps me <laughs> I guess I'd say good for them <laughs> good for you mate Keep, yeah. carry on overthinking if it works for you look I've learned that certainly in the histamine world everybody is different and it's quite an interesting dynamic because I've noticed a lot of the people who are most quote successful in the world are successful partly because they are so utterly obsessed with that one thing succeeding in their chosen field. And I've got some really good friends who have risen in the broadcasting world, for example, some of the most successful people are also some of the most unhappy because they worked so hard. And by being constantly hypervigilant and checking those tweets at four o'clock in the morning, that's what's made them get to the top. And there's no damn way they, they're letting anyone else climb onto the pedestal ahead of them. But it's not necessarily a recipe for long-term happiness. So it's just about a balance. And that, that can be quite difficult for people sometimes when they attribute their success to being that type A, hypervigilant, always on personality. Yeah. Chris Williamson talks a lot about this. He uses examples of uh, you know, Tony, sorry, Tony Wright. And he uses Tony Wright as an example yeah. of success. Oh, uh, no, he, he uses um, like Elon Musk and Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan and look at their lives. Yes, they're incredibly successful and rich and famous. Michael Jordan certainly doesn't look happy when you actually interview him. And, yeah. and Elon Musk, when he was on that, I think it was a Rogan episode, he was like, you wouldn't want to be you wouldn't want to be me. You may think you want to be me, but you don't. You wouldn't want my brain. There's no off switch on it. I'm just consciously, con continuously anxious, continuously overthinking. And mm. uh, yeah, I don't think people realize that Yeah, the, the, the great people in the world or the richest people in the world, they're, they're not necessarily happy. Yeah. And I'm interested to know with you guys, actually, because it's a, it's a dilemma for us all the time. How many hours a day do you work? Because if you want to have a life and do 10,000 steps and go to the gym and not work too hard and not get super stressed, to me, it seems that there's not that many hours left to actually work. Yeah, I don't work that hard. Yeah, to be fair. But Andy's got a full time job and does a podcast. So Andy, what about you? Yeah, actually, I, my boss listens to this, but um, I actually don't think I work relatively hard in terms <laughs> of the corporate world in central London, because I make room for some of this stuff. So I think it's like, a lot of people just have you know, the, the job is there the non-negotiable and then you wedge the other stuff in whereas i've made a conscious effort to wedge this stuff in and therefore the job will have to work around it but that's probably not normal for someone <laughs> who's 36 and trying to get on in their career <laughs> yeah it's no, it's, it's so hard because i'm fairly conscious and also with the demands of being a parent there's just there's so many less mm. hours in the day and mm. you think i know that i'm doing all right I, I could be doing better but there will be people, some of my competitors, some of my peers will definitely be working double as many hours today as I've worked. And I'm pretty comfortable with that. Here I am mm. in Portugal. I'm just going to enjoy life and accept the fact that I'm doing a certain amount of work per day. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I just finished reading Morgan, who sells Psychology of Money. It's a really good book oh, yeah. on, on finance. I've read it. But, yeah, yeah. yeah it's um, excellent. One of the, the, the things he says, if you want to be a successful investor, just expand your time horizons. Don't think, oh, I want to make mm. Bitcoin, you know, I want to double my money in a month. Think, I'm going to invest in ETFs over 20 years, mm. and then I'll probably double my money. But that's also how I think about you know, my career. I'm expanding my time horizons because I work less, because I go to the gym and I spend time with my, my family my dog and travel i'm not going to be as successful as quickly as someone who's as you say tony working twice as hard so i'm yeah mm -hmm. i'm accepting this by being like okay maybe i'll be where i want to be in in 10 years rather than five years but then there's the there's also perhaps for us here we are lovely and comfy we've we're not 22 with with five quid in the bank and we haven't we can't we can afford a pint of milk mm. and there's sometimes there's more of a necessity behind that drive and uh, yeah maybe as we get older we do lose our edge a little bit yeah definitely no obviously yeah. uh, it takes a lot of privilege <laughs> and we always own our privilege on this podcast but yeah certainly I, I, I'm, I'm very privileged etc I'm um, owning my, my biohackers' pri privilege, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, am I allowed to ask Tony about Portugal now, Rich? Yes. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. What? Yeah. <laughs> what brings you to Portugal, Tony? I'm assuming it's a full-time yeah, location. Yeah, it is. It is. We. I've always loved travel, and me and my wife, when we had our boy, I thought that was it, and I spent a lot of time looking at caravans. Because all my mates told me how horrendous it is trying to go for holidays in the middle of summer when everyone else is taking holidays <laughs> and how you have to pay eight grand for a week in a three star hotel in Mallorca. And then last year we thought, why don't we just go for a winter to Thailand and see if we like it? And my boy was three at the time. I went to school out there and enjoyed it. And we didn't feel that was quite the place for us to live long term. But then we thought we'd try Portugal for a year. So we came out here. And we do have some friends out here, our, our mates who run the Exhale Coffee Company, which you might have heard of. They live out here. Mm -hmm. And it's great. There's loads going on. I'm going to a, a talk on microdosing very soon. There's lots of, we've made lots of friends here. There's ecstatic dance parties. There's, it's a pretty wild, fun, like most of those I don't actually go to, but I'm going to the one on microdosing. <laughs> and then we've, yeah, we've met some nice people. And that was the most important thing for me, as much as it's lovely to, you know, be outside more, live a healthy life, to, to feel like you're part of a community and to make some new interesting friends and feel mm. like you've got mates. Mm. Without that, we'd be home. But we're loving it. And I, I'm hoping both of you, that the invitation is open to both of you now. Andy, you too as well. Oh, thank <laughs> you, That's what you wish for, Tony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd love to host so you. Take my golf yeah. clubs, I'll be out the next week. Um, well, we, I, we live on a golf course, Andy, so I think you'd be very uh, happy here. Yes. Yeah. One of the questions I was probably going to ask you both as well is with the biohacking stuff, how important is the community? Because presumably when you started sort of pivoting into this space, Tony, you probably mm. felt that you were sticking your neck out a bit and that you, know, you had presenter friends who probably weren't into any of this so how, how important was it to find the right people i'm obsessed with community and <laughs> uh, yeah i definitely was the self-help guy in the tv world for a lot of years but then towards the end and definitely now they all seek me out and say mate can i ask you a couple of questions about this but i think yeah i wrote this book on burnout and i spent a long time thinking about why we get burnout and burnt out and what it is that helps us recover. And all the research suggests community is pretty much the most important thing. Yes, it's still this sort of luxury, quite niche thing. We've all heard about how the blue zones are blue zones because of mainly because of weather, diet, a lot of exercise and community. The 86 year old man walks down the hill at lunchtime, has a glass of ouzo, plays a game of chess with his mates and then walks home again. And he's seen his mates, he's got his community and he's had his glass of ouzo. <laughs> Perfect. That's the sort of life I want to live. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm obsessed and with community. I think it's absolutely key. And pension mm. fraud, that's that's another thing about blue zones. You heard that one, Tony? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> These yeah, the blue zones, the blue zones are actually the, not only where people supposedly live longest, but it's also the areas with the highest amounts of pension fraud in the world. So what is effectively oh, that happening? that is hilarious. Supposedly... <laughs> People are, they, they're living in multi-generation families and grandparents, great grandparents are living there and they're collecting their pension, obviously, but then they die and then the family
family just keep collecting the pension so they're not reporting that these people have died so affecting the statistics making people think there's loads of centenarians when actually it's just people <laughs> stealing from the government oh, that is hilarious mm. yes. oh, so i thought you were going to say that that means they're all richer therefore they're happier but what it actually means is there aren't even centenarians yeah. there in the first place. The most dishonest <laughs> places. Yeah. The blue. yeah, yeah, exactly. That is so funny. Yeah. <laughs> but I interviewed someone on my podcast recently who's in Portugal and who is trying to create a Portugal Blue Zone community, which is quite a nice idea. But I'll have to let him know that what he really needs to do... <laughs> Mm. Fraudulent uh, community. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's certainly community is is super important, and I think biohackers are getting more on on board with that. More and more people are talking about community. But what else about city life did you find affected your health negatively? I guess the usual stuff around it's quite a sensitizing environment when you're surrounded by a lot of traffic and a lot of people although to be honest i love the energy in london and at times i've missed it being here but more it's obvious but the weather is just lovely here and today it's a beautiful 20 degrees and i just went and had a half hour walk in the sun and then lay in the sun for a while before doing this podcast and it makes it quite hard to work when the weather's that nice <laughs> but but i've been going in this swimming in the sea for example almost every other day and that sort of thing is just so hard to replicate when the weather's not so nice. So that is obviously a massive deal as well. Food is a good one here. You know, the, the Portuguese cuisine is simple and delicious. Lots of fresh ingredients and not too fancy. But also good quality ingredients are a lot cheaper here. Now, I'm not... They're cheaper for me. I, I really can't tell you if they're cheaper for the Portuguese people based on the fact that the average income or the, the minimum wage here is very low but but plentiful good ingredients is certainly something that we've appreciated here mm. yeah purchasing power that's something i've become interested in as i look to find the best place in the world to live purchasing power is is the key metric it's not the cost of living because in san francisco cost of living is, is extremely high i think it's like the sixth highest in the world but then salaries mm. are mega high here school teachers earn about a hundred thousand dollars a year and yeah i saw an advert for a, a wow. police officer for 120 grand a year so they need to be able to be able to afford to live yeah. there but somewhere like madrid where my wife's family are from purchasing power is much less there so they actually feel like things are more expensive in madrid than someone you know a school teacher in san francisco feels in san francisco so if you're coming from london you go to madrid you're like oh my god everything's so cheap here but the madrileños they don't feel like it's cheap so purchasing power is that key metric like which you basically alluded to there it's, it's the cost of living compared to people's salaries but yeah i was also going to come on to the sunlight thing so one of the things i found mm. is yes you get a real mood boost from the sun when you haven't seen the sun in a while so mm. i thought when i move to california because it's sunny every day i'll feel happy every day but that's not the case. Right. It's only when you go from a like cloudy, wet, wintry mm -hmm. environment like London to Portugal, San Francisco, Spain, you get that serotonin spike. So unfortunately, you get sensitized to <laughs> the good weather. Um, so if people are thinking, oh, I have to move to the south of Spain, like most English people do, or you have to move to Southern California, uh, don't necessarily think it's going to cure all your problems. See, I, I'm not sure I agree with that, Rich, but I have, I've i been living out of London less time than you, but yeah. I am still, every day that it's a nice day, I'm like, oh, brilliant, look at that, <laughs> it's lovely. Um, and I'm, maybe I'm still in the noob phase because we've been here about seven months, but I genuinely do appreciate that good weather. And here, I, I guess it's a fairly similar climate to what you have, the sunny sort of chilly at times winter but it never gets that cold and we went back to the uk for a week and we did some we got back ah oh, it's great and we went swimming on, mm. on new year's eve and new year's day and that sort of thing is nice because you're really able to get out in nature more and so feeling quite lucky about life and then we also the purchasing power thing is interesting because we've been selling our house in london and looking around portugal and saying look at that isn't it cheap and everyone's saying no that's actually very expensive <laughs> don't get over excited but it's just compared to london which is insane it's mm. a bit cheaper <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah 
Speaking as someone in London, I can tell you I'm very much looking forward to seeing the sun after the wettest February on record, which has been followed up by, I'm pretty sure, the, the wettest March to this point. So, yeah, I'll take March. either of those locations. Yeah. Light is so interesting, isn't it? I, I find myself increasingly quite obsessed with light. And in summer, there's no better place in the world <laughs> than London, London and yeah. the UK and the festivals mm. and everything else. But yeah, it's hard, especially hard when in the middle of winter, it's getting dark before four o'clock. Mm. I think one of the um, things that I was thinking about when you were both speaking is vitamin D. And obviously, that seems to be one of the supplements that's gone mainstream, I would say. I mean, it's in every supermarket now. Are there others we're missing out on? I wanted to ask you both about that supplement because i think that falls in the category of things you just hear so much about mm. vitamin I'm a d junkie so okay good rich i don't, good. Rich, I don't know about you yeah. are you a supplement oh, yeah. junkie well, yeah. I, I am but i unfortunately I, I actually think that taking too many supplements affects my digestion and actually when i dial things back and just take basics like well, at the moment i'm just taking boron and magnesium and the the, the low dose naltrexone my digestion is fine but if i like take like 20 supplements i'll be going to the bathroom several times a day so i'm not sure if it's like the really? gelatin capsules or my gut just doesn't like all these intense nutrients mm. so what are the non-negotiable supplements for you tony I, I have my new one, which I love. And I told you about this, Rich, last summer. And I hope you took my advice and tried it. Um, specialized it specialized pro-resolving mediators. Did you try Ooh. it? It's on, my, it's on my list of things to try. Yeah. Yeah. Specialized. Yeah. Yeah. specialized pro-resolving mediators. But if you just Google SPMs, you'll find it. And I'll tell you why I'm so excited by them. The SPMs are a form of omega-3. And it is the form of omega-3 that your body turns omega-3s into. And a sort of high-powered scientist six years ago found that he could create SPM out of omega-3. Before that, you couldn't buy SPMs. And they are still expensive. A bottle of, talk about privilege. A bottle, <laughs> talk about our biohacking privilege. A bottle of this will set you back 70, 80 quid on Amazon. So it's at least double the price of omega-3. The first interesting thing is when you open the bottle and the brand that I use is SPM Supreme, um, but I have tried life extensions as well. And that's the same thing. You open the bottle and it smells completely different from normal omega threes, which smell, let's be honest, like fish oil. This yeah. smells like ice cream. It's extraordinary. The smell, there's not a hint of fish in there. I cannot understand how they make it smell so good. And I've tried more than one brand. So it's just a thing about these capsules. Mm. And then I took it because of the promise of it helping with inflammation. And I assumed by inflammation, that would be like inflammation in the joints. And I haven't noticed any different in the joints, but I noticed the difference in my gut and the inflammation in my gut. And my gut's been a lot better since I've been taking it. So I've, I like it. Mm. Nice. Yeah. One of our questions was going to be, what's your sort of yeah tip for the next, for the trends? Because the last recommendation I took from you was spermidine and I've incorporated that in there. And you do, I do have SBMs on my list of things to buy, but yeah, we've yeah. answered that. Any, anything else you think is, is going to be big in the biohacking industry? I think spermidine is great for a lot of people. I personally don't take it at the moment, partly because some a lot of spermidines are not gluten free and because i think the best form of or the best source of spermidine has gluten in it mm, then you get some spermidine exactly yeah. yeah you get some spermidine capsules made out of chlorella and spirulina which can set off a bit of a detox reaction and can be quite high in histamine so i i do avoid those ones i'm certainly open to taking them Yes, methylated vitamins. For anyone who hasn't looked into methylation, mm. it's just such an interesting area. Andy's, oh, Andy's, I'm sharp right intake of breath. Yeah. <laughs> and simply because if you're not a good, methylation is what happens when you take, when you eat good food and you take vitamins, methylation is basically what happens in the body when you process the vitamins. Rich, I've probably completely butchered that, but you're the person to tell me whether I've got that roughly right or not. Methylation, yes, is a reaction that takes place in the cell. It's a detox reaction in the cell, isn't it? Um, yeah. I haven't heard it related to, to vitamins like that, but uh, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a very complex uh, yeah. system that probably involves many things, including what you've said. Yeah, it's exactly what I said, Rich. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I heard the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so essentially, when your body's taking in nutrients, methylation is how you process the nutrients. Let me try. Let me try that again. See if that works a bit better. And some of us, it turns out, genetically don't methylate very well, which is why one person will get a bad gut or an inflamed knee because they're not processing nutrients properly, and another won't especially with certain vitamins and supplements like B, certain B vitamins. If you take bog standard B vitamins that you find in the supermarket and are the cheapest ones in the market, they probably won't be very good for you if you're not a good methylator, which is why you need to spend a bit more on methylated vitamins. And I, I'm really excited about methylated vitamins. They've made a huge difference to my health, but still a lot of people don't know about them. Mm, yeah, I've... I used to get IVs quite regularly for, for B vitamins because I used to be low on them. And yeah, I used to ask, I'd have to go, do you have methyl cobalamin? You need that mm. methyl, methylated version of it. But then I started to have too much. Did you know you can have too much B vitamins? So I used to get things like restless leg syndrome. Like I'd be twitching oh, yeah. at night. And then someone said, yeah, someone took a look at my blood reading. It's like, oh, you've got way too much B vitamins. Have you, do you get twitching and things like that? So yeah, B vitamins are great, but also too many B vitamins are also not so good for you yeah i i did know that and actually when i started on the methylation vitamins because i'd lived 40 years of my life not methylating properly um i started taking methylated vitamins and i promise you i had the best two weeks of my life i just felt amazing i felt like i could break the world record in long jump i felt that healthy and then my body just tipped over into this massive detox Herxheimer reaction. Mm. And I felt dreadful for two months. So start slowly with these methylated vitamins, especially if you've had some unexplained symptoms. If you've been laughing through the pain for a while, <laughs> start very slowly with the methylated vitamins. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, how, how would you know? It, these are all very specific things. How, how, would you, how do you measure this sort of stuff as biohackers? With the methylated vitamins, I was working with a practitioner who did some tests and they just showed that my, my methylation range was low okay. and that I genetically was not a particularly good methylator. Mm. Yeah, yeah I've, have you heard of the DNA PACE tests, Tony? The sort of the aging. Okay, so I've just done this. I, I want to do it in, in one of our Q and A's, Andy. I want to talk more about this. But there's the DNA PACE test. We give blood and you send it off, and they find out how fast you're aging. So they'll give you your biological clock, and a big part of it is how well you're methylating. And they're using the the Horvath measure, which apparently is yeah uh, the best measure of how, how much you're aging, and it'll show you uh, mm -hmm. for every one calendar year how many years you're aging so the highest amount they've ever recorded is is 1.6 so for every one let's say someone's 10 years old they'll be 16 years old with their methylation or the lowest anyone's been is, is 0.6 so if someone's 10 years old in the calendars they'll have a, a body of a six-year-old but there's a, like an olympics there's a methylation olympics and ben greenfield's <laughs> on it brian johnson's on it and it's dave asprey is on it and it, yeah people are trying to age the least so they've got two tables one is who's aging the slowest and also who has the biggest difference between their actual age and their methylation age and the person who's at the top of it is this 64 year old guy and he's got like the the body of a, of a 40 year old and he, his lifestyle is very simple doesn't drink alcohol eats like a standard paleo diet got a little bit of a, a call there but yeah, it does yoga, does saunas and, and, and nothing too complex. But yeah, we'll, we'll do a bigger episode on that. But in this test, they show you how well you, how genetically you methylate. Wow. Because I've done Glycan Age. Mm, I've done that um, too, yeah. Yeah, and met the guys at Glycan Age. And it's a really nice idea. It's a totally different principle, isn't it? Yeah, so and it's, I was yeah. quite disappointed that they. I think I, I was forty-seven, and they told me I was forty-six and a half. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, yeah. Rich, how did it, how yeah. did that go for you? Where are you at the table? So I haven't got my results yet. So I'm waiting for my results. That's why we'll oh, do it in let's our do Q &A, a big reveal yeah. on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we oh. could. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. But my yeah, glycan age. So they measure glycans in the blood. So it's a different measure of aging. There's many different like measures of aging. One is one is methylation. One is glycan. One is telomere length. One is like 
like grip strength. One is how quickly you, after you press, like grip your skin, how quickly it goes from white to pink. That's a measure of aging. Gait speed mm. is also a measure of aging. A grip strength that I mentioned. But um, yeah, my glycan age was, I think I took it when I was 35 and my glycan age was 34. So yeah, not particularly impressive. Yeah, same, same as me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Tony, you, you've interviewed every single top biohacker out there, haven't you? So having access to all these people, who, who are the biggest influences on you? Who do you trust the most? Who are you most interested to hear from in the biohacking space? Other than Richard L. Blake. Yeah. <laughs> Other than the two of you, I have to yeah. say. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah. Actually, you go. Why not? <laughs> I guess my influences have changed over time. The person I'm currently completely obsessed with. And the reason is, I think it's very hard in this day and age to have an original message. I started my podcast in almost 10 years ago. And I struggle sometimes with the fact that I've been doing it so long, I don't want it to get stale. I want to keep innovating and trying to capture people's attentions in different ways and that's harder than ever and eddie abu abu i don't know if you've seen him on instagram oh, yeah, no, no. absolutely brilliant he spells his surname a b b i e u w he's got over three million followers the former bodybuilder who moved to the uk from africa as a child or a young adult and it's such a simple thing that he does. He basically preaches the normal thing that a biohacker would preach, which is good food, no sugar, so so on. And he's got this, <laughs> he's got this catch, catchphrase called wake the fuck up. And now he can do a video where he literally is just in a supermarket, picks up a, a box of, I don't know, <laughs> Kit Kat cereal. And he's like, guys, wake the fuck up. And it's just <laughs> such a, he's so good. He's so funny. Everyone loves him. And he somehow manages to do something really simple in a very original way and capture people's imagination. And his content is good. I do find it very inspiring. It does make me think I'm going to get more chicken and less crap in the supermarket after I've watched his stuff. So finding different, you can't reinvent the wheel, can you? But different ways to capture people's imagination, I love. I have been very inspired by the likes of Ben Greenfield, Dave Asprey. I love what Tim's doing with the Health Optimization Summit, and, and he's become Tim a Gray, really big yeah. name in the space as well, Tim Gray. And I also think that in the UK, Davinia Taylor is fantastic. I just thought like really, she's former Hollyoaks, Sunday Times bestseller on biohacking and hormones, and just, again, like such a real message. She'll, she'll film you a real mid-run, that sort of thing. It's hard to be that natural and provide good content, but I think she does it great. What about you guys? Andy, who's I've your biggest influence? Got, no, you, you go first. Well, I'm just researching what Rich tells me to research, to be honest. But I was, I was going to say that the, the piece I'm missing, I suppose, is people in the UK doing this. Mm -hmm. Because I my assertion is that it's more of a West Coast, US, maybe a bit of Austin, that kind of area. Mm -hmm. But what, what, who are the big people doing this in the uk because it's still just if i mention biohacking to 10 people eight of them are going to look blank yeah frankly yeah tony is one of the big i the way i found tony was i think it was on the london biohackers meetup facebook group i said i've had enough american biohackers are there any good podcasts from english people and everyone recommend tony's podcast tony is the guy that was many years ago but yeah also tim gray i'd say he's probably the most uh, the most followed and yeah as I say, he set up the london biohackers meetup years ago that i used to attend that's now this huge event called the health optimization summit um anyone else yeah. tony with Tim, it's great because if you put the UK's leading biohacker in your Instagram description, eventually you will be the UK's leading biohacker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Those other two that I mentioned, Davinia Taylor, absolutely brilliant, much more female focused and capturing the imagination of a lot of people because some people just don't like the word biohacker and that's absolutely fine. I've struggled with it for a while and then I just thought, oh, everyone's using it. Who cares? If it's because biohacking to some people is putting a chip in your arm and making PayPal payments with it and that sort mm. of thing, which is quite different. But really, when you dig into it, the message of bio, you know, good food, lots of light, bit of grounding, uh, probably quite boring. And we all know that here. But I think sometimes that's why I've struggled with the word biohacking for people who don't get it. But yeah, Davinia Taylor and look up Eddie Abu. He is absolutely brilliant. He's in his 60s. 
He's such a huge star. He said the other day, he said, I've been invited to go and talk with all the academics, with all these academics. They want to debate diet with me. He said, they can fuck off. <laughs> they can see what I'm into. If they disagree with that, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like he's got the Rich Blake attitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. If you disagree yeah. with Rich, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's me as well, so I like <laughs> Rich's attitude. <laughs> Mm, yeah um yeah i think about 50 percent of our audience is u.s based so for, for the u.s listeners mm. out there there are many good biohackers out there i think ben greenfield is still number one in my opinion i did go to a the eterna fest in austin a few mm. weeks ago where both dave asprey and ben greenfield were on the same stage i think for the first time ever and yeah ben Ben and Dave, they are they're so interesting they're such great speakers they've always got their fingers on their pulse and I think yeah, they're, they're ready to admit when they're wrong as well so yeah I, I really do love those guys still yeah you tempted to move from California I, to Austin I am very tempted <laughs> um, yeah I have been spending some time more time in Austin I'm gonna spend some more time in Austin to uh, to yeah make a bit of a network yeah because it, uh, for me the way I say it, see it is if you want to be in tech you move to San Francisco you want to be in entertainment you move to LA if you want to be in wellness you move to austin right now but mm. uh, yeah i think it's quite an exciting place yeah definitely definitely and if you want to be into wellness with a touch of hippie and some retiree golfers <laughs> move yeah. to portugal yes <laughs> Can we starting up a commune yeah of biohackers. i was yeah. going to say that surely the challenge for you rich is to build a new community of biohackers you don't want to go to austin and follow the others I think I'll just integrate myself in there. But that is one of the reasons I want to go he there. He does want to follow the others. Yeah, yeah he I does do. want to follow the others. <laughs> it's with, with in San Francisco, it's people aren't there for to push the boundaries of wellness as much. There is a big wellness industry there. But in Austin, I feel like there's so many people I could learn from and yeah, look up to in that regard. Whereas in San Francisco, I haven't met anyone that is in the same space as me. Hmm. As in, in, well, in Tony, what works in the biohacking space. I was going to ask you, Tony, what's next for you? From a personal perspective, my main business is books and I love it. And I've been bringing out a couple of books a year for the last two or three years. And that's been great. I'm going to do more of that. And courses based on what we've mentioned, which is the intersection between health and mindset, which I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. And then I feel that apart from that, which excites me and I love I think there's going to be some sort of project in there I don't quite know what it is but that just makes use of the contacts that I've got in the in the health and wellness industry some big idea that I have I don't know whether it's going to be I don't know it could be an alternative to the Ura ring who knows what it'll be but there will be something over the next couple of years that by the way I've actually been road testing an alternative to the Ura ring oh yeah oh, ultra wow. human ring ultra Which human is, i don't know if you've heard of that yeah no. i think no. they have seen it is it available at the moment is it or are you a beta it, tester it, no it is available it is available and i found that in some ways it's a bit better than the euro ring but i didn't like the fact you can't put it into airplane mode mm. at the moment mm -hmm. they are apparently releasing a an update a patch for that but it's also got it's also got a very short battery life compared to the Ura Ring, so that so those two things mark it down a bit. But it was giving me more sleep per night. Oh, so that, yeah. oh I like this. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I've I found that with the Ura Ring as well. I've have you heard of the Dream Sleep? It's like a headband. It's an EEG. I use that for a little right. bit to, to compare my my sleep with the Ura Ring and the Dream Sleep and the Dream, which is much more accurate because it's reading your brain waves. It gave me about ten percent better sleep efficiency than the Ura Ring. Did so, it? Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And that is one of the properties anyways, of these metrics is like sleep anxiety. It's, oh my God, I got 78%. Yeah. Last night I got 78% sleep anxiety, sleep efficiency, which is clinical yeah. levels of insomnia. But I don't think I did because I felt like I slept okay. <laughs> but what is sleep efficiency? It's how many times you, you wake up in the night and how long you're awake. Yeah. Sleep. If you're a hundred percent, you have a hundred percent sleep efficiency. It means from ten a ten p.m. to six p.m. you were asleep the whole time. But most people have micro awakenings at the end of every sleep cycle. So you wake up yeah. very slightly just to check your environment, and then you go back to sleep. Whereas I wake up and then I'm I'm awake for maybe five ten minutes between every sleep cycle, which is not healthy. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I've got a couple of theories on that, actually, which is the first one is that if my I wear my Ura ring on my thumb and I just think it's a bit loose and therefore Ura thinks I'm waking up more <laughs> and I am probably under the clinical insomnia mm. uh, list as well. But I also interviewed Matt Walker, the author of Why We Sleep, mm. and he was wearing an Ura ring and he said, I think they're great, but compared to the stuff we've got in my lab, it's not that accurate. So take it with a pinch of salt. It's nice to have stats like this, but they're not perfect. Yeah. I notice if I've had a bad night's sleep, I won't check my aura ring until the evening because if I check it and it's, oh God, I got five hours sleep, yeah. it'll it'll perpetuate in my mind and I'll make myself think that I'm, I'm more tired than I am. Mm. Yeah. That's exactly what I did today, actually. <laughs> I should have followed your advice tomorrow. <laughs> If I sleep badly, but when you've got a sick child and you're a bit bunged up, uh, it can mean uh, not very much sleep. Yeah, yeah, I need to do that tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we mentioned it earlier on the show where we find you, Tony, but it's can you repeat the website again for us and where else can we find you? Yeah, my website is TonyWrighton.com and you can find all the details on my books and courses there. The Healthy AF Method which incorporates some of those techniques we were talking about, the pattern interrupts and everything else. And then there's the histamine site, which is histamineintolerance.com. And you're on Instagram. You do a bit there as, and you've got the podcast as well, right? Yeah. At Tony Wrighton and Zestology. And you can, if you go back far enough into the back episodes, you'll find me and Rich squeezed into a 1.5 person sauna recording a podcast in there yeah <laughs> My, we, well, i think i've done been on three three podcasts we did yeah one one on breath work one on ayahuasca and then we did the book club as well the, uh, the zestology yeah. book club that's right day. that's uh, that was i only ever did two episodes of that but i'm um, sorry mainly I'm so bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> you are excellent rich but the logistics of getting guys the logistics of getting the three of us to do this is hard and thank mm-hmm. you by the way for moving the slot today i really appreciate it but when you're trying to get four guests and you onto a book club oh it just wasn't worth it <laughs> mm, yeah yeah fair enough thank you so much tony it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you thank you i've had a great so holiday much. mate yeah thank you so much yeah where do we where find us like rich, rich? We are on all good podcast platforms and some rubbish ones. Laughing through the pain, <laughs> navigating wellness. I'm on Instagram at the Breath Geek. RichardLBlake.com is my website, and Andy is at Andy Esam uh, on Instagram. Esam. Yeah. All right. Thank you now, everyone Andy. for following. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, listener. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.